We're having this morning. This is the day we're going to welcome nine new members in the church. There are others who are preparing to become members of the Glad Tidings when the time comes right. It's, an, it's a growing community of faith. And I am so happy today to be a part of what's, what God is doing. So I'm going to, first of all, ask that our leadership team would come up here first. Because we're going to be praying for them. Alright, so everyone on the leadership team, you need to come up right now. Okay? And you're going to stand behind these good looking folks that are going to be coming up. Alright? Why don't you stand on that end because I'm going to get all messed up over here. Okay, thank you. Good looking guys, huh? All right. Well, the first couple I'm going to welcome is Dan and Carol Massey. We please come. Here. I know I saw them already this morning. Oh, okay. You went the long way, huh? Okay, good. Well, uh, okay. Just stand right over here. Front of these good folks, will you? All right. And uh, oh, take this. It's hard being in a chair. You're stuck. <laughs> and I'm always in everybody's way. Oh well. Yeah, I am. It's all right. I'm over it. It's okay. I only fell on my head. I'll have you around any time. Jerry and Peg Preet. Our members are getting better looking all the time. <laughs> now we have the most important folks here. Ken and Yvette Lemire. Will you come up? says that Christ ascended on high and gave to us gifts. And here are the gifts right in front of us. And I believe that each of you have a gift to share in this body. It may not be a talking gift. Well, mine, mine sometimes isn't either. But, you know, it's really, it's a gift of some kind. Some kind of thing that will edify and build up God's people. So look at, see these people? These are the ones you've come to join, to serve, to love, and look at, see these people? We can love them back, amen? Yeah. So we're going to pray for them, and then we're going to have a little admonition from Paul the Apostle, and we're also going to say together, we're going to stand for that part, we're going to say together the affirmation. So I'm going to ask Trish, you need to come, because you're going to pray for these people too. They have a very special role. To the pastor's wife. Right? <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> this is the only time I give her instructions. <laughs> the rest of the week, is she's giving me instructions. All right, let's pray. Father God, lay hands on those good folks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we are thankful today that you have sent the Holy Spirit. You have ascended at the right hand of the Father and you make intercession for us. 
And Lord, you enable us and you give to us gifts of grace that we might bless and encourage one another. I pray for each new member today that they will realize the gift that you have made them to this body. And Lord, that together we will build up the kingdom of God, that we will be a kingdom of priests and kings unto you, Lord, that we will be a temple of praise. And God, together we will glorify your name. Lord, I pray that you will enable the Holy Spirit to flow through them in your gifting. And Lord, in the specific way that you want to use them in the body. Lord, we know that all good things come from you. And so, Lord, we recognize that, that it's a greater result <laughs> that you are doing, Lord, for eternity. Lord, there is something eternal going on here. And Father, we pray that you'll knit our hearts together, help us to speak the same thing, to always act in love. And Father, when we make those mistakes, to forgive. And Lord, to treat one another as you have treated us and treat one another as, as we want to be treated. Lord, that your name might be glorified in every way. We pray in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's give one a, a clap. I know I'm going backwards here, but I'm going to ask the back line to walk all the way around and, and just start going down this way and giving these good folks the right hand of fellowship. Will you do that? And as you do that, Trish is going to come and going to read the charge. To God's church in Northern Rhode Island, to you who have been called by God to be his own possession. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. I thank God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ. Through Jesus, this church is enriched in every way. We have every spiritual gift we need as we eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep us strong to the very end, so we'll be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus returns. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says, and he has invited us into partnership with his Son. So I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then discover true happiness by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with singleness of mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others, but be humble putting others before yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take interest in the needs of others. You must have the same attitude that Jesus had. He said, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We who are strong in faith must be considerate of those who are weaker. We must not just please ourselves, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ did not live to please himself. So may God, who gives you patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice to bring praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be glorified through you. All praise and glory be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask that everyone stand. And if you would just turn right around, we're going to look at the seven affirmations and speak them together. By God's grace, I'll turn all right, we're going to say this together. Are you ready? Let's go. There is only one body of saints called the church, and Christ Jesus is the builder and head of it. There is only one spirit by whom we are rescued from sin, regenerated with him, raised to life, and reconciled with the Father. By the spirit, we are born into the family of God, empowered for service, and equipped with supernatural gifts. By Him alone can we manifest the fruit of Christ's character. There is only one hope to which we have been called, while together we await the appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our resurrection to eternal life with Him. There is only one Lord, who is worthy to reign over all the earth and heavens. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is only one faith bringing salvation by the grace of God. The Lord's Supper is a perpetual memorial proclaiming our shared faith in the substitutionary work of Christ the power of his gospel, and the prophetic glory of his coming kingdom. There is only one baptism confirming our union with Christ, his atoning death, the power of his resurrection, the authority of Jesus' name, and our participation in his church. There is only one God and Father of all people, by whose sovereign pleasure and power we live, are loved, saved, granted eternal life, and adopted into the inheritance of his beloved Son, Jesus. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. I'm going to release all the children now to go to children's church. God bless you, kids. We have a preacher this morning with, that doesn't need any special, special announcement, but I'm going to give her one anyway. Chrissy Dezenzio is coming to preach the word. Amen. <laughs> And I guess I never thought I'd say this, but I've known you a long time now. Think of that. Her kids were rugrats when they first came to this church. A long time ago. Yes. <laughs> but Chrissy is a woman of God. And I believe that both women and men, both women and men, and preach the gospel. I want you to know that because this woman lacks no authority. She's a child of God. And not only is she a child of God, she is a rich saint who knows the word of God. And I know that you will be deeply moved and touched today from her message. But I want you to know that it's the caliber of a person that makes the message. All right? This is not... A simple thing. Uh, this is a lifetime thing. And uh, she didn't pay me to say this, but <laughs> and she does probably is saying, I wish it hadn't. But I don't care what you know about that. It's all about receiving one another. My mother taught me a long time ago the Holy Ghost chooses the one he wants to fill. And when the Holy Spirit chooses a vessel, he does so for a purpose. And I hope that you 
are enriched today and that you receive. Are, are you ready Amen. to receive? Amen. Comfort. Let's welcome. was all in, and he was calling his disciples, his followers, to be all in. So that was from Mark 8, 31 and 37, and uh, he was telling everyone, here's what's going to happen, and Peter began to rebuke Jesus. He took him aside and began to rebuke him, and Jesus turned around and rebuked Satan, who was influencing him, and he told him that you need to have in mind the things of God. You need to have in mind the concerns of God. All in people have in mind the things of God and not the things of themselves, what they want. And so he said to them, if you want to follow me, you need to just deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me and do it. So if you want to follow, you're like, hey, I want to, I want to go with Jesus. Uh, you need to deny yourself, take up the cross and then do it, follow him. Um, and then week two was about Abraham and I really, really enjoyed that sermon a lot. Um, Abraham was all in, and he showed it by his willingness to sacrifice his son. So from Genesis 22, he showed that his obedience was an act of worship. And um, I'm thankful, it's so funny, I was going to say, I have in my notes just almost what Rebecca said, and Pastor also, that um, th we're thankful, we're so thankful for people with skills, musicians who have great voices, and, and the people that lead us in singing and worship to God. And so... They lead us, but it's up to each of us whether we worship. And it's a heart thing that only God knows. So we can even look like we're worshiping, um, but God, you know, and we can look like we're not, but we may be. So really it's a heart thing, and God knows that. Uh, but true worship to me is if you can sing to the Lord in the middle of your storm. In your moment of sacrifice when God's called you to do something you don't want to do, can you then sing a song in your heart to the Lord. That's true worship, in the moment of your sacrifice and obedience, when there's no music, when we don't have a body plan, you know, um, in those, mu those times when you don't even have your CD player working or, you know, something to sing to. Can, does a song rise up in your heart in the middle of the dark moments? That is worship. Um, and so also, Abraham, um, we notice that uh, we see worship and we see being all in by selfless generosity. Um, we talked about the widow's might, the lady who had, Jesus highlighted the person who gave the least in the offering because he knew she was giving the most. And so, um, and then the little boy's lunch, who God was able to multiply and do miracles with. So giving affirms the Lordship of Christ. And in Matthew 22, 37, we have heard this over and over, but love the Lord with all, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And sometimes it's our time, sometimes and regularly it's our income, our money, we're honoring the Lord with that, our homes, <coughs> Pastor Rebecca and Jim and their family gave of themselves extremely when they lived, let us live with them for two months. The teeters gave, opened their home. That is, that is a giving thing. And so whatever it is that God is asking you to do. So today, um, I am talking about all in prayer. Okay, and so I want to highlight this card. I know we've been talking about it the last few weeks. 
Um, we are in a uh, we are in a campaign to pay off the building. We want to see it all paid off, and we want to rebuke the devourer so that the bank is not getting all the interest. We want to be able to pay it off, and so this is a Somebody say amen. yeah. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Um, so I highlighted some things on the card that I have here because um, most people, when they pick up the card, they go right to the money part. They're like, what am I going to give? What am I going to give? And we've asked people for a few weeks, take these home and pray over it, okay? But I want you to see that on the top it says, a prayer of faith. Please pray with me and us. We are believing that God will. And so I really want to take time for this to say that we want to agree with you to believe for your greatest need. What is the miracle that you need? What are you asking God for? We, uh, as prayer teams and as the leadership of the church, want to agree with you for your greatest need. Because right now in Glad Tidings, our greatest need is to pay this off so that the devourer is not any longer uh, devouring our extra money. We want all the money coming in to go to the glory of God, the work of God, and, um, and we're thankful for loans and all that, but we want to take, get it taken care of. Um, and so, it says down in the commitment, we believe this is a defining moment in the history of Glad Tidings Church. God is working here in a unique, unique way to reach our community. We prayerfully commit to step out in faith and pledge. Okay, so that part, stepping out in faith and pledging. Um, I also want to mention that we have the other card that we have that we already talked about is the Connect card. So we, um, we receive prayer requests on this all the time. Feel free to do that. If you happen to, because there were a few people who filled out one of these cards and didn't put a prayer request on it. So if you still have this one in your hand, I want you to write on it, put this with my pledge card, this is my biggest need. And we will, we will match the two up. Because we want to be praying in faith with you. And we are committing to partnering in prayer with you for this need. In Matthew 18, 19, we know this scripture pretty well. If two of you <clears throat> on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you. Okay, yeah. anything. Anything is a big word. Okay, just with that. And when there's a several scriptures that say whatsoever you ask, okay? Anything, whatsoever, these are big, big words. Um, and it says here, if you, two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. So there's this connection Jesus is making between heaven and earth, okay? Where two or three, and we quote this a lot, come together in my name, there I am with them. Um, so I want to just say that we are partnering with you, and that scripture uh, has actually, the picture that I get is this. Think of the Verizon commercial, okay? I think there's like one guy, and then he's like, he looks behind him, and there's like this whole, you know, group of people behind him. And uh, we've heard the saying, behind every good man is a... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, and even Allstate, I think that's the car commercial when you hear, when they go, you know, something about Allstate, and the guy shows up in the car with them, okay? So I, was, I think of those things when we agree on anything. It's not just that he's with us, which is great, because he's already inside us, you understand? But it's that he's, he is with us to believe with us for the thing we're believing for. Understand? So there is a there is more to that than just Jesus is with us. Um, and I want you to understand also that the, there's you know superlatives are they're like big words, right? Like the best at anything, better than something. Jesus in the scriptures tell us a lot to believe exponentially, believe for more because. When I say we want to believe with you for your biggest need because God is big, like that's just not good enough. That's not a good enough word. God is more than big. Like he's exponentially big. We can't fathom how big he is. And so um, I wanted to talk with, about that as well. Like believe for the big thing. We need to have audacious faith. We need to have ambitious faith. Like I got some big words going on today. Uh, <laughs> all right, because God is that. That is who we are serving. We're serving an amazing God. Uh, thank you. And I also want to say a pledge offering, what it is not, okay? It is not what I can afford. It is not determined by last year's W-2s and tax refund. It's not determined even by this year's. Um, it's not determined by what others give. It's not determined by what you think that we might expect you to give, okay? 
even like the little, if you give this much, it, it turns out to be 2,000 or whatever. That's just a guideline. That, those are just guidelines. We ask you to go home and pray about it because we want God to speak to you. And um, we want you to hear from the Lord in faith. We want faith to begin to work in you. Okay, we want to increase. If you've already got some faith, we want to increase it. Um, if you've only got a mustard seed, it says, is all you need. But God will increase it, okay? Um, and the cool thing is that a pledge offering in church, a pledge commitment at church, I don't know if everybody really gets this, so I feel like I need to spend some time on it. It's an opportunity to believe God for something impossible. Okay, that's why it's not what we can afford. It's the opportunity to believe God for something impossible. It's the opportunity to stretch ourselves. Now, in Hebrews 6, uh, in that chapter, it talks about that God himself swore on himself to Abraham um, that his promise would come true. Because there's nobody greater than God. You know, so people swear on God and all that kind of stuff, and we say not to swear. But the idea is, when we make a pledge or an, uh, a promise or an oath to do something... And we are doing this, in this circumstance, we're saying it's not based on what I can do. I am making this commitment based on what I believe God is telling me to do. So who's behind that? God is behind that. God is the one, if he is saying, if you're in your prayer closet, you're at home with your husband or whatever, or you're by yourself, and you pray about it, you've been praying about it for three or four weeks, and God has like dropped a number in your head, and you're like, mm, I don't know, whatever, and you're not sure what you want to do, but if God has spoken to you, then God is the one who's promising to make it happen. Do you understand? And so this is your opportunity for God to make it happen. And then when you're done, you're not like, oh yeah, I'm so glad I have a good job because you know I make enough money to give offerings. No, it's because I am so glad that I was in my most desperate place. I made a pledge offering that, because God told me to. And this year, I have seen him meet that need. And that's going to be amazing when that happens. And we're looking forward to it. And we are, um, and we are agreeing with you for it. Amen. Um, so please think, even now, what, what's the biggest thing I'm, I'm believing God for? And if you haven't filled out the prayer card at the end of service, make sure you do that, okay? Um, <clears throat> and also, it's one of those places where we say, Lord, I'm laying my need on the altar, and I'm choosing to agree with the church for the church's need. And God always honors sacrifice when we put ourselves down and we lift someone else up. Um, <clears throat> so... Jesus, this is the cool thing too, Jesus, we learn in Hebrews 6 and 7, is our high priest forever. And I had a thought about this. Sometimes we think that he went to the cross and he endured extreme agony that no one else would. And he died for us and he laid down his life. And we think, you know, he rose from the dead and then he ascended into heaven. And um, his job was done, you know. Yay, yay, Jesus, thank you. But no, no, his job is not done. He is ever interceding for us. That is the job Jesus does. He is there. He did not just pass the baton onto the Holy Spirit and say, okay, Holy Spirit, you know, it's your job now. No, the Holy Spirit is in us in revealing Christ, and Christ is with the Father interceding for us constantly. So he's always working. So whenever we get in this prayer, it's not just Verizon with us having a huge network of people behind us supporting us. We have all of heaven behind us. When we pray and when we agree, we have all of heaven, all of the power of heaven. When we're asking in his name, according to his will, he's spoken to us, then we have him behind us. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Even this week have had an answer to prayer. Come on, think of, just think of, is there something this week that the Lord has done answer to prayer for you? Okay. I want to say that God has, he's, he is a God that answers prayer. Um, even this past week, I was going to put it on Facebook and didn't have a chance. But um, at Women's Prayer on Wednesday, the ladies prayed over me because I'm pre preaching today. And Miss Rebecca said, you know, that she, like, because they laid hands on me and she said she felt something. She didn't even know what shoulder of mine was hurting. And, um, but she said she felt something moving, you know, and whatever, clicking or something. And, uh, and I felt like a heat on me for the next five minutes. But um, so the, this whole, the sense then, uh, the major pain in my shoulder has gone away. And I have a little, yes, praise God. And so I am just believing every time, every time that it started to, you know, like felt a little tightness over, I just said, uh, thank you for my healing, Lord. Thank you for my healing. And so I'm trusting him. 
And then another little one is I lost a pearl earring while I was taken to the dog to the groomer. And then when I got back, I'm like, Lord, I really pray that it will be there. And I got back and asked, said, you know, I lost a pearl earring. I think it was when I was wrestling with the dog. And um, the I left. Yeah, I know, the wrestling. Um, and I left. As I was leaving, I said, let me look on the road one more time. And as I was looking, a lady ran out. She says, yeah, someone brought it in. We found it. So I was like, thank you, Lord. Just a little thing. The Lord loves me. So, <laughs> Okay, so let's jump into this prayer, all in prayer. Uh, let me ask you, when you go swimming, uh, do you, are you the type that just dives into the water because you don't want to, or are you the, you know, just tippy-toe and kind of, you know, just acclimate to the water. All right, I'm a dive-in person because I just like to get the suffering over with quick and, and then be happy after, okay? Um, well, so diving into prayer is sometimes difficult for people, okay? There's lots of people who don't like praying out loud. There's people who are just not sure about praying. And I'm going to tell you, we've been doing school of prayer, and we could teach on prayer until the cows come home because there is just the Word of God is full of it. People's experiences are just endless. And um, so that's not what I'm here to do today. But I do want to say basics. Prayer is a conversation with God, and it's based on having a relationship with God. Yeah. Okay, so we know the term born again. Um, a lot of people hear it. Some people don't really understand it. So born again simply is from John chapter 3, a conversation that Jesus, that Nicodemus snuck in the night to have a conversation with Jesus. And he said, you know, it's, uh, you need to be born again, not naturally, but spiritually. And so that's where that term comes from. And then the other term is saved. So um, we want to be, what are we saved from, okay? In the, um, in the scripture, it talks about our sin nature. In Romans, uh, Romans has what we call a Romans road. When we're trying to lead someone to Christ, we're able to just to take the Bible out and say, look, this is what the scripture says. It says there's none righteous. It says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Okay, which one do you want? And then it says God demonstrates his love for us that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then this one is really important. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. Okay, so this is a heart thing. Nobody can see the heart thing. Only you and God know if the heart thing has happened. Okay, really. We, we begin to, hopefully we begin to see evidence of what's in your heart. That's the hope, okay? But the truth is, it's the heart issue is between you and the Lord. Because you believe with your heart, and you're justified, but you profess with your mouth. So if you are saved, you should be somehow, if you're like newly saved, you want to tell people, you want to tell someone, I gave my heart to the Lord. You know, like I became a Christian. I'm born again now. And, um, but in a regular thing, we should be professing Christ regularly. And it says, um, for, and profess your faith and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. And there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And then chapter 12 of Romans is just full of evidence of what a Christian life should look like. It's really good. Now, a lot of people get stuck on verse 1 and 2 because it talks about living sacrifice and what's holy and acceptable unto God. But the rest of the chapter is really good too. So if you're going to read Romans 12, don't just sit there in verse 1 and 2. Uh, because we do need a transformed life. It talks about your life gets transformed when you become a believer. But then it, it talks more. Love is sincere. You've got to hate what's evil. And there's just so much good in Romans 12. Okay. So um, I was thinking about prayer and the fact that, okay, God knows and hears everyone's, hears everything. Okay. So God hears everything. He knows everything. So for believers, that's comforting. For unbelievers, that's a little uncomforting, discomforting. Whatever. Um, and side note, the devil is not equal to God. The devil is not everywhere. The devil does not know everything. Okay? He has his limited things. So sometimes we do the yin-yang thing. We think that God and the devil are equal powers fighting it out. But it's not true. God is greater. The devil was created. Okay? God is the creator. The Lucifer was created. So there's a total difference there. Amen. Um, so God hears every prayer. But he listens to the prayers of those he has a relationship with. Okay, so the prayers of a sinner, or an unsaved person, or an unbeliever, um, that God hears and answers is this. The humble cry that says, please help me. Please save me. Please forgive me. Please rescue me. We all know that when we're saved, I mean, there's some people who are saved, and they can say, I'm saved from, and they can give you a list of what they've been saved from. Thank God. They've been delivered and rescued. 
and a lot of us need to be rescued. Um, <clears throat> religion, you know, often says to like say a prayer. We hear that a lot, like I say a prayer, and um, that's kind of in our, especially if we've been brought up in certain churches. That's part of our cult. That's just part of our culture. What we're used to saying a prayer. But really, prayer is the conversation with God, and it's the relationship with God. And I wonder if you're getting it, but the Christianity is about relationship. It's about relationship with one another at church, and it's about relationship with God. Um, and I wonder sometimes if God gets a little insulted, and I don't think so really, or annoyed with repetitious prayer. You know, because if your heart's not in it, then it must, you know... I don't know. But what I really do think is that he's sad. I think that it, it, I think it breaks his heart. But John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life, that you know God and you know Jesus. Yeah. And knowing him, our relationship. Do we just go to strangers and just like pour out our hearts and like, oh, you know, this is all the things going wrong. We don't just go to a stranger and do that. And do we go to some a friend and just like repeat things, something over and over again? <laughs> you know, like, God, please help me. God, please help me. Rebecca, please help me. Rebecca, please help me. You know, like, we, that would be a little too much. And really, because we're just used to it, <laughs> because we're used to hearing that type of prayer in just generations, um, we don't always think about it. But, it. but Jesus wants a relationship where you talk to him, he talks to you. You ask him a question, then you listen for his answer. And then when you're going about your day and he speaks to you, you go, oh, God, thank you for speaking to me, you know? Or your cell phone, oh, yeah, thank you, Jesus, nice to talk to you. And, you know, God does that throughout our day, just like our friends, you know, a text or a call, um, our family. God does that. That's the relationship he wants with us. And um, I think about how religion gives us that false sense, a false sense of a connection to God. Uh, but we need the relationship. And it reminded me of like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, how you can like follow like a famous person, like a star or somebody, and like you can see all their posts and everything. And it gives you the sense like, hey, like, I know them, you know, this is cool. But the reality is you don't, they don't know who you are at all. <laughs> okay, they do not know. And so that is a false sense of, that comes even with religion. So today one of the things I want for, to help each of you. One, I want you to be confident that you are part of the family of God. I want you to be confident that you are born again, that you are saved, and that you know that when you're praying, God is listening to you. And that you know that when you pray, you'll also listen to God, that he wants to talk to you. Amen. And secondly, with that Romans road, I want you to be confident how to lead somebody else to the Lord. We, every Christian, needs to be able to lead someone else to the Lord. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to even be, like, you don't have to have your Bible out. But you have to know the ideas. You have to be able to somehow, and there's so much fear. I'm going to tell you there's so much fear in that. But God will overcome that. He is faithful to overcome that. If you see someone who wants, if, if God puts you in a situation you know where someone is asking, you're, he's gonna, the Holy Spirit's going to speak with you. The Holy Spirit's going to fill you with the words that you need. Okay? So we can move on from that to say... Prayer begins with a relationship, okay, but continues as well with a lifestyle of lordship. Okay, so we have to be all in. The lordship of Christ is different. Like a lot of people don't like that Jesus is their savior, but they don't necessarily want to connect with the Jesus is my lord thing, okay? Because that means that we have to take us off the throne of our hearts. We have to let Jesus sit on the throne of our hearts. So um, historically, Adam and Eve had unhindered communion with God. They were able to talk to him any time. And then sin entered, we know that. And then Abraham, um, God, you know, God would say to him different things. Um, and it would say, God said to Abraham, or God said to Moses. And so God wasn't talking to everybody like he was to both Adam and Eve. And then I have a, uh, Elijah, Elijah at one point got a word from the Lord. So prophets, a lot of the prophets would just hear a word from the Lord. So 1 Kings 17. Okay, this is really cool. I really love this. But one of the things that prayer does, okay, one of the things that we need to have in order for our prayers to give us that sense of connection with God and even to have our prayers answered is the position that we place ourselves in with God. So one, being saved is that position, okay, God, I'm a child of God. I'm in the family of God. I belong to this. Like, like you're my dad now. I can ask you for things. You've adopted me into your family. So I can ask you. You're my father. We have a relationship, okay? So that's a position. So I'm going to read 1 Kings 17. Um, I'll start with verse 2. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn east, hide in the ravine east of Jordan. 
You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So, just like Abraham, he did what the Lord had told him. So here's obedience, okay? He went to the ravine, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Okay, neat point. He could, he, those ravens could have actually gone into Ahab's house, who was the wicked king, taken the food, the king's food, off his table and flew it out to him. Okay, that's kind of a cool thought. Because, you know, those days they didn't have, like, windows and all that kind of stuff. Like, the birds kind of just were everywhere. And so it's pretty neat to think that maybe he was eating food right from the king's table. Okay. Sometime later, the brook dried up. Okay, so that brook dried up. But originally, it was, the reason the brook dried up is because God wasn't sending any rain because he was punishing them. So God made this happen. The brook dried up and there had, because there had been no rain. Then verse 8. The word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went. Okay, so he's obeying. He's also hungry. So uh, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering her sticks. Now, I'm not sure if God told him which widow, but as soon as he got there, there was a widow gathering her sticks. And he called and said, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I can have a drink? As she was going to get it, she's like, yeah, I can handle water. Water's at the well, you know. As she was going to get it, he called and said, Oh, and bring me a piece of bread, please, too. And then she's thinking, All right, now you've gone too far. <laughs> and verse 12, As surely, this is her, this is the widow replying, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we might eat it and die. So I'm not sure if she had an attitude, because if this was actually the widow that God directed to feed the prophet, and she's like, you're God, and now I'm going to go die. You know, so I'm not sure if she had that kind of attitude, or she was just depressed, like, you know, you're God, don't want to do this, but now I'm just dying. I'm not sure, but, you know, you put a little of your own flair into it. Okay, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, first, make a small loaf of bread for me, from what you have, and bring us to me, how selfish, seriously. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. The jar was not used up and the jug did not run dry, in keeping with the word that the Lord had spoken. Amen. Amen. So, pretty cool. Now here, so we find Elijah was positioning himself in the place for God to provide. Because the Lord came, the word of the Lord came to him and said, leave where you're at and go over there. And he did. He left. And the Lord told him, the ravens are going to feed you. And I'm sure, I don't know if he thought, well, does that mean they're going to like drop dead and I'm going to cook them? Or, you know, what does that mean? So, but they actually brought him food. So that was pretty neat. So he, he, his obedience placed him in a position that the open heaven was there and provision came to him. Okay? And um, then the word of the Lord came to him the second time. Now this time, it didn't just involve him in ravens. It involved him in a widow. Okay, and so the Lord came to him and also said, I have directed a widow to take care of you. So God's working a couple angles here. He's telling Elijah on one side, this is where you need to go. And he's telling the widow on the other side, hey, a prophet's coming by and you need to do what I say. And obviously her attitude didn't sound like she was pretty happy. Sometimes we don't have a good attitude when the Lord tells us, right? There are times when God's telling us to do something, we're like, seriously, you know, like, God, haven't I given enough? You know, like, haven't I done enough? Has my love life been... You know, bad enough. You know, why are you asking me these extra things? So she was ready to obey for the water, but then when it was like, give me some bread, it was a little too much. But you see that as she finally, as, as she got confirmation from Elijah about the word, and she went ahead and did, again, God put both of them now in the place of receiving the provision. So obedience positions us, position them, okay, to receive the provision that God for him. So the position in our position in prayer is really key. It's really important. And like I said before, there's tons of lessons on how to pray. But first, we need to be in a place to be able to have that relationship constant, okay? John 14, 14 says, again, this is another one, ask anything in my name and I will do it. And something that I read said, I will make, if I don't have it, I will make it for you. Okay, we, have, we serve a creator God, right? So, and again, there's that anything word. 
Now, I just heard a sermon, and I'm going to tell you guys go on because I don't want to preach his sermon. But his, the sermon that I just listened to was the space between ask and receive. Okay, we are asking God for things. We don't always receive the thing that we want, and sometimes it's a year, and sometimes it's 10 years, and sometimes it's 30 years, and we don't understand what is going on there, okay? And what he talks about in this sermon is that space is the maturity time. It's the school of maturity, the space between the ask and the receive. He promises, he says he'll do it, he's a faithful God, okay? That like God is not a man that he would lie. So God's word is true, and he is faithful. That time between, he's like, you can't handle the answer yet. You can't handle the provision yet. I need to get you ready for it, okay? So submit to what he's doing to you, in you, through you, in you, in your situation, in your circumstance, your storms and stuff now, so that you will be ready for the provision when it comes, okay? We can apply this to dating over and over and over again, you know? Be who God wants you to be rather than looking, looking, looking. Because if you're spending so much time with your eyes everywhere else and not, um, and not on, hey, me just pleasing the Lord and being a, you know, close to Jesus, like be, be it. It's, it's more important. So num number one, what is your position? Are you born again? Have you a relationship with Lord, the Lord already? Have you begun that? And two, are you in a place of obedience? Are you in a place of dependence? Are you in a place of surrender? Or are you doing things your own way? So now God is so good to us because he doesn't call us to surrender every single thing when we first get saved. However, there is, a, there is that difference between born again and saved. The one thing about being rescued is sometimes when we are in such a desperate, desperate situation. Like I'm thinking like terminal cancer or, or someone who's been stabbed and is bleeding to death. Okay, or someone who is drowning. So when you pull a drowning person up out of the water, they're, they're gasping for breath. They want to take it all in. They're not just taking little baby steps. They're like, oh, just give me a little air. I'll just take a little air. No, no, no. They're like, fill my lungs, fill my lungs with air. Okay, so like being born again is like, as a child, you know, we grow in stages. But there are people who are delivered from things when they're saved because they have been rescued from a pit. All right, so if your life is in a pit and God's going to rescue you from that pit, you're not going to say, oh, just bring me up a little, Lord. You know, just a little now. And then next week I'll come up a little more. No, you're going to say, like, lift me up and take me out, rescue me and save me. And you are going to be radically saved, okay? Radically changed. That is the kind of, so some people are like that. And some people who are young and give their life to the Lord before life has a chance of beating them up. Um, then they will kind of do that gradual spiritual maturity. So it's different for everybody. But I just want you to think about that sense of salvation um, being more than just some spiritual maturity levels, okay? But also being complete surrender, complete deliverance. And awesome. God has that for us. Um, so what does it matter to us as leadership how you're, how you're doing, you know, how your lordship situation is? Um, it matters to us. We care enough because we're not just offering fire insurance so that you don't go to hell. Okay, because um, we could actually, if you get saved, you know, there's some people who laugh. I've heard this said, they probably said it better than I could say it. But, you know, we could, like, when people get saved, just shoot them so they go to heaven, you know, like, that way you don't have any chance of ruining it, okay? Or let's say a baptism, instead of, like, baptizing them and bringing them back up, we could just, like, you know, just leave them under and say, okay, now they're in heaven, they're saved, they are really completely saved, okay? So, um, we do not do that here at God Church. Okay. <laughs> but we want you to know it's more than just a get out of hell card, okay? It's a relationship with Christ. It's not just, I'm a Christian, sign here and put it in my pocket or put it in my purse. You know, it's not just a membership card. It is a relationship with Jesus, okay? And so if you are currently saved, you know, 10 days, 10 years, whatever, but you're in a lifestyle a lifestyle I'm saying, okay, that is not pleasing to God. And you know that there's some disobedience. You've read it in the Word or someone else has told you, you know, this is a disobedience to the Lord. You need to get it right. That is a Lordship issue. That is an issue of making the Lord Lord of your life. Take steps to do it. Talk to a leader. Work it out because honestly, there's really no standing still in Christ. Yeah. You either need to be like moving forward, like following Christ, or if you don't follow Him, then you become lost again. Okay, so like that's a whole other sermon, but anyway, so stay close to Jesus, follow him. We love 
all of you. And I'll get into something else later about us. You know, we're, we're also checking our hearts. We're also trying, keeping ourselves in a place we need to be. So Adam and Eve uh, had continual communion. They had open access to God and sin. Then there was like random words of God. And then Jesus enters the scene. He's the Messiah. Okay, so he's a child. He comes unexpectedly in a way that they didn't expect, okay? Um, he grows up. He walks with men. Um, and a lot of them, his, the religious leaders who should have recognized Christ, who should have known all the prophecies, who should have known about Bethlehem and all these different things, didn't recognize him. Okay, the word, the word, when the word of the Lord came, this was the word was dwelling among them. Okay, and Jesus was preaching, repent, repent. Repentance is turning away from the thing that you're doing. Like, repentance means a change of mind about something. Like, I used to think this, but I, my mind has been changed, and I am going to follow Christ. Okay, so that's, repent, that's a part of what repentance is. So Jesus says, follow me. And Jesus welcomes the children. This is Jesus. But he can only be in one place at a time. He can only be walking with the group, and 5,000 people are trying to follow him, but he's only one man. Okay? Okay? So, um, he is divinity contained, okay? Uh, he teaches the disciples, uh, even the prayer, the prayer, they said teach us to pray, so he teaches them, we call it the Our Father. Um, in that prayer, you see, you can either memorize the whole thing, like most of us have done, and just repeat it, and just repeat it, and just repeat it, or you can look at it and say, what is it saying? What are the themes in this? The themes in that prayer is adoration to God. Surrender in faith. Your will be done on heaven, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. Again, that, that heaven and earth connection. Then physically meet our needs. And then help us to forgive. That's, a, that's like, okay? And it's conditional, as you have forgiven me. Well, he forgave it all. So we're supposed to forgive like he forgave us. And recognize that, because it says, and then, you know, save us from the evil one. There is evil, everybody. If you don't know that, I'm not sure where you've been. Okay. So Jesus positioned himself to receive from the Father. He constantly went away on his own. He constantly stepped aside. He, um, he needed to be in connection with the Father. Okay, so his example in John 17 is good. If you're writing scriptures down, John 17 is good for Jesus is praying for himself before he goes to the cross. He's praying for his disciples and he's praying for us. Um, his example of staying in connection and in relationship with the Father and submission to the Father is what we need to follow. He stayed connected to his source. Jesus did. He was a man. Okay, yes, he was God, but he set aside his divinity to be a man. So he did not have, he did not have a one-up on us. He chose to be a man so that he could suffer and feel everything that we have felt and walk in what we've walked. So um, he learned, Jesus, if the scripture tells us, Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. So why do we think sometimes that we won't have to go through some suffering? You know, and if we do, and we obviously we know that we are going through suffering, but uh, sometimes the connection doesn't come that Jesus learned obedience through his suffering. So God is going to teach us through our suffering. Now I have this uh, evangel Julia brought home because she was reading it. And, uh, but the first thing, like I didn't expect this in the first, this is about BGMC and missions and all that, but the first thing he talks about is prayer warriors. And he said, all, all, all Christians should be prayer warriors. Okay? So, it is not a gift of the Holy Spirit to be a prayer warrior. It is not an exclusive club in the church. Our ladies group meets, but anyone is welcome. Okay? Monday night, anyone is welcome. Um, as long as we keep having it. So it's not a club. But prayer warrior should be a synonym for Christian. Okay, and why is this? So that's kind of like a lot of people think, oh, we have some prayer warriors in our church and they're just awesome. Okay? And I, I consider myself one of those. I try to pray constantly, okay? And there's a few of us that I know and there's people who don't get to come to church to pray together. But I know that they're at home praying. I know that they're prayer warriors at home. And I'm thankful for them. But... That's not an excuse for each of us not to become a prayer warrior. The scripture is full of it. And so I read from what I read from earlier is Ephesians 6. So you need to, guys, you need to get your Bibles out when you go home and read some of these, okay? Ephesians 6, read that over again. The armor of God. Armor is for warriors. We are warriors, okay? Whether you have decided to believe it and 
enter into the, the, the battle? The fact is we are, okay? So the verse 18 I read uh, earlier, it said, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests and be alert and always keep on praying. You know, our, the storms in our life should serve as boot camp. If you were told when you got saved, okay, in this life you will have trouble. Just like in love and respect, we are trying to tell people. The scripture says, you know, I don't really encourage you to get married, but if you get married, you're gonna have some trouble, okay? If we really think about that, it's true. And I mean, it's the word of God, so we know it's true. We just don't always focus on that. We always, you know, think of better things, I guess. But the reality is our life is going to be full of storms. Our life is gonna be full of trouble, Jesus told us. And so the idea is you're either in a storm or just come through a storm, or you're preparing to enter the next storm, okay? So be prepared. And in love and respect, he talked about people who go out fishing. People who go out fishing don't just think, oh, the water's always gonna be smooth, everything's fine, and if it gets bad, I'm just gonna jump out and leave my ship. No, they don't. They prepare for the storms. They have all the stuff they need to batten down the hatchets and all that, and so they're ready when it comes. Maybe it doesn't come, that's awesome. There are a few marriages that have been smooth sailing. I don't know any of them, though. But, um, <laughs> so, be prepared for the next storm. Don't let it take you by surprise. You know, because sometimes we get on this, like, when we've come through and we're, like, in this refreshing time, we're like, oh, hallelujah, I can relax. You know, rest in the Lord, but don't, you know, don't relax, really. So, prepare for the storm. <laughs> Um, you will have trouble, but Jesus said, I have overcome, okay? Yeah. And in John 16, I'm going to read this. It's a message version. version. It's John 16, verse 4. It says, I didn't tell you this earlier because I was with you every day, but now I'm on my way to the one who sent me. Not one of you have asked, where are you going? Instead, the longer I've talked, the sadder you've become. So let me say it again, this truth. It's better for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the friend won't come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he'll expose this world's uh, view of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll show them that their refusal to believe in me is their basic sin, that righteousness comes from abo above where I am with the Father, out of their sight and control, that judgment takes place as the ruler of this godless world is brought to trial and convicted. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. But when the friend comes, the spirit of truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all truth. He won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what is about what happens. And indeed, out of all that I have done and said, he will honor me. He will take from me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine. And so, again, we understand that, again, we understand that the God's behind us. Um, I do want to have a time to open the altars. I know this wasn't a lot about how to pray, what to pray, but this is about the position that you need to be in in order to understand, in order to come in to that uh, relationship with God and into that constancy and be able to learn how to surrender to the Lordship. It's hard sometimes when God asks you to let him improve some part of your life or let him remove some part of your life. So today, what I want to ask is when we, um, if somebody comes to do some music, um, if, if you want, want to surrender to the Lordship of Christ in an area in your life that you already know God's been ta talking to you about, all right, this is the time to come forward. If you want to make a public profession, you know that maybe you've been saved but kind of like just sitting and afraid to come up, well, I am breaking out that. There should be no fear about this altar. There should be none, and I'm going to tell you why. The enemy, if you're afraid, it is totally the enemy trying to um, hold you back. Because the steps of faith that it takes to step up here is breaks something. It breaks the chains. It breaks the chains that are holding you in your seat, and you're telling Satan, you don't have control of me. God does. I'm his. I belong to him. And so if you want to surrender again to the Lordship of Christ in some area in your life, you know that you've been a long-time Christian or whatever, but you need to surrender something that God's been speaking to you about. If you want to make a public profession, or if you've never prayed the prayer of giving your life to Christ and you want to come up and do that, I just want to say the people up here that pray with you aren't perfect, but I will tell you what happens. We pray last night. We pray this morning. We pray in pre-service prayer. We prepare our hearts so that we're ready to give so that we're not all about ourselves. 
You know, and when we're even sitting in our seat, if we're convicted of something, in our heart, we're saying, Lord, forgive us. Get it, help us to get it right. So that we can be of service to all of you here. So it's not that we're above you or perfect or in any way, but we are here to lead you. And um, so we just thank you for that and thank you for your time. And I really want to see God do amazing things. And so when I open this altar, please don't hesitate. Just get up and come up and these guys are going to lead and sing it. And then listen, if you're a leader in this church, please come up and pray with people. If we're not going to like stand here one by one, but let people come up and pray. I mean, really, if I was sitting in your seat, I would be up here because I would want to be just more of God, less of me, more of God, okay? And it's just a moment. You don't have to linger, but it's a moment where you're saying, God, yes, I want people to know that I want more of you. Amen. And I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh 